Hey everyone, Jared Sandler here with you, and we are now catching up with uh, Bobby Wilson, former Ranger, great once at two Grand Slams in a week, and uh, now oversees the catching throughout the entire organization and does more than just that. Bobby, uh, happy off season to you. Yeah, thanks for uh, for having me again. Um, it's getting close, man. It's getting close. Getting ready to go here soon. And you know, it, it feels like the season's so far away, but Pitchers and catchers will report uh, there in early February. And uh, now with a lot of the offseason activity, uh, it does seem like things kind of pick up. And the Rangers have been active already, acquiring three guys who figured a factor into the rotation. Jacob deGrom, the biggest name, Andrew Heaney, and Jake Odorizzi. Odorizzi was acquired in a trade, deGrom and Heaney, free agent signings. Uh, let's start with Jacob deGrom, Bobby. You've... Uh, you, you've obviously seen this guy work. I don't know. Do you have any sort of relationship or any sort of direct familiarity with Jacob deGrom? Well, I faced him in the minor leagues, so I've, I've definitely seen him uh, pitch. Um, when he was in Las Vegas, I was in Reno, um, and they actually had a three-headed monster there. It was it was deGrom, uh, Noah Syndergaard, and Montero were there at the same time, three starters. Um, and I can remember everybody uh, uh, was goo goo gaga over – uh, you know, Syndergaard and Montero. And I can remember saying like, no, I think the DeGrom guy, I think he's going to be the best out of the group. Um, you know, and, and thankfully my eyes, uh, didn't lie to me because he's, he's, he's definitely special. Um, you know, and, and looking forward to getting around him more, uh, to see what makes him tick. And, and that'll be part of what our catchers do. I know that they've already reached out to him. Um, I've reached out to him just to welcome him. Um, but like you said, with the off season, with the, with, with the signing him, this is when it all starts, right? This is when we start to build our relationship. Uh, and with our catchers, it's the number one thing, pitcher, catcher relationship, pitcher, catcher communication is the number one pillar, um, set up in our, our catching department and our, and the way that, uh, uh, we set everything up with, with our pillars. So, um, the guys have already started that communication with them and, and we're going to see, um, you know, where he's at in spring to to get a little bit more familiar with him. All right. So with DeGrom and Heaney and Odorizzi, well, what is what are those initial conversations like right now? Because uh, Jonah and, and the rest, rest of the catching crew, presumably they're not uh, dropping down and catching bullpens right now, talking shops. So are they just kind of developing that personal relationship or are they already talking X's and O's and strategy and trying to figure out what you know these guys like and don't like it's going to be more personal at this point it's going to be you know you know how's your family doing you know what are you doing for the holidays um because pitchers if you don't show them that you truly care about them they're going to be out on you you know so it's it's for catchers it's truly getting to know them uh away from the field and, and building that personal relationship because honestly when you get down to it and you get into the game and you put down a finger, that pitcher has to know that he trusts what you're doing and he trusts that you have his best interest at heart. So that relationship is built, you know, before we even catch a bullpen, um, it's built in between their starts. Um, it's built after their start when we have conversations uh, at the bucket during BP the next day, which I call the, you know, the water cooler time to where we, we talk to them about, Hey, what could we have done better for you? Um, and at the end of the day, it's about the pitching. I mean, it really is. And you see, see why going after pitching this off season, because, you know, pitching is, is what wins you championships. As far as your conversations with the catcher. So, Hey, the Rangers signed Jacob deGrom. Uh, you're reaching out to Jonah and telling him what, or are you kind of giving him space to operate without, you know, you kind of watching over him. No, I let him go. Um, it's, it's, you know, we talked about, Hey, it's exciting, you know, and obviously Jonah with, with the Grom who, you know, uh, has pretty good, uh, control commands, um, you know, talking about, you know, what that means for him as well, uh, with as well as he's done with his receiving stuff. So, um, you know, it's basically, Hey, here's his number. You guys do what you do. You reach out, you make the connection, you start building the relationship. 
Um, and that's something that as, uh, I don't like talking about myself personally, but as, as a, a journeyman catcher, that was something that I had to do every off season. Um, cause rarely did I, did I go back to the same team, uh, two years in a row. I think I did it with Texas and, and with, uh, Anaheim, the two teams, um, that I did do that with, but all the other teams, you have to, you have to do your homework. You have to know, how does this guy pitch, you know? Um, how does he use his pitches so that when you do get to that first bullpen and, and something that we do in our catching program is, is we make sure that our guys are prepared with how they pitch, what they're trying to do, what they're working on, um, what they need to get better at um, and kind of target those things in their bullpens. But this time in the off season is spent watching video. Okay. This is how DeGrom pitch. Uh, this is what he likes to do. Okay. And now once I get into it, I have a conversation. Now he goes, Oh, this guy actually does care about me because he watched video. So um, that'll be part of this off season moving into a uh, pitcher catcher report date. I, I'm just curious. You, you know, you mentioned you, you played for a number of different teams. Uh, the Rangers in 2015, you arrived right around the same time that Cole Hamels was traded to the Rangers. Uh, but same day. I, same day. Okay. So, and I imagine, yeah you had been on a team before though, when they made an acquisition or maybe over an off season, you know, I gosh, you know, the angels, while you were with the angels, they made some big off season moves, acquiring Josh Hamilton and Albert Pujols, for instance, what does that do? Like, what are those conversations amongst teammates when Jacob deGrom is, is added to a team when a guy of his caliber, I mean, are you know, guys side texting, like, Oh, can you believe this? And And how does that kind of boost the morale especially for a team like the Rangers uh, lost a hundred games two years ago, made a little bit of improvement last year, but you know, haven't really sniffed uh, competitive baseball in September now for a few years. Yeah. I, I think th there's definitely excitement, right? There's excitement with, with Corey and Marcus last year. Um, but we still knew that knew that we had to add pieces. So I think it's, it's fair to say that everybody in our organization our fans, our players, they're sick of losing, you know, like we are, we were sick of it. And, and, you know, I've bought into CY's vision, like, no, we're going to win. You know, it's not, Oh, I hope we win or man, I wish we could win some more games. Like, no, we're going to win and we're going to figure out a way to win. And I think everybody's has bought into that vision. Um, obviously even with the coaching staff that we've, we've brought along uh, with Boach, with, with Venable, with Mad Dog, um, you know, and, and Donnie and Timmy, like, you know, and the, and the guys that we we've had here before is we're, we're ready to win. Um, and, and this is, this is, it's time, it's time for the Texas Rangers to, you know, put their flag in the ground and say, okay, we're going to win. We're going to be dominant. Um, we're going to do what it takes to win baseball games and ultimately win a world championship. And that's just kind of where we're at. There's no, I wish I want, and it's no, we're going to do it. All right, we mentioned the the command and the control with Degrom. A lot's been made of the velocity. Uh, he has reliever type velocity that more or less is sustained over the course of a start, which is you know absolutely absurd. Uh, there's a reason he's been so dominant when he's been on the mound. Uh, but is there anything else that really stands out to you about what makes him so special? Yeah, I think it's pitching in his lanes. Um, he does that really well. Uh, his, his fastball slider has a curveball that he mostly uses to lefties um and, and his change up so I think him pitching in lanes and and from watching video seeing him pinch it pitch to his glove side lane quite a bit and if you talk to any hitting coach like one of the biggest problems for hitters is pitchers that pitch in lanes that have multiple pitches that come off of that lane um if that makes sense so you know with him with his fastball with high velo and then his slider at high velo um he can he, he can actually triple that up with his change up if he wants to off that same lane so um, I know he's kind of experimented with a cutter a little bit, um, but that's a nightmare for every hitter, for every hitting coach is somebody who pitches off one lane, but has multiple pitches come off that lane. And you see the best pitchers in the game. They all do that. They all tunnel their pitches. Um, and even here in, uh, you know, his, his press conference the other day about his slider, right. He tries to make his slider look like a fastball for what 59 feet. I think he said like that's pitching and, and, and those guys are the toughest to handle, but obviously, the velocity, like good luck, you know, hundred miles an hour, 
um, is, is not easy to, to handle. And then a 93 mile an hour slider back in my day, I'm going to be the old guy back in my day. 93 was a fastball, not a slider. Yeah. So, um, he's definitely special. And, and I think we're all excited to get around him. You know, who asked him that question about the slider, right? I think it was you, wasn't it? It was, I am fascinated, uh, by that pitch and I can't wait to watch him, uh, and, and watch it not only just once, but over the course of a start and how hitters react and, you know, we don't, we haven't gotten to see him much, right? You know, he wasn't an American league guy. He's not a, not that you see a whole lot necessarily in spring training, but you know, he was a grapefruit league guy. So, you know, even any chance to just see him try and knock off the rust for three innings, never had that opportunity. So I, I'm really excited to see him. Now we have seen a lot of Andrew Heaney. We've seen a, you know, a decent amount of Jake Odorizzi. Don't want to overlook those additions uh, because pitching depth is huge. I think, you know, we've, have seen this play out year after year after year. Any year you do not have pitching depth, you always get exposed. Uh, and sometimes you you can have pitching depth on a Monday and then, you know, two days later, an injury, another injury, and a guy who just can't quite figure it out, and all of a sudden you don't have pitching depth. So uh, even when you have pitching depth, you maybe don't have pitching depth. But uh, Odorizzi and Heaney, uh, let's start with Jake Odorizzi because I know you know him really, really well. You played with this guy uh, what, what can you tell us about Jake and, and maybe what gives you the confidence that, uh, you know, after a little bit of a down year, uh, he can bounce back and, and take form of a guy who the Rangers, it seemed like for about two, three straight years, were interested in acquiring midseason in a trade when he was pitching for Tampa. Yeah, so I, I have some track with with uh, Odorizzi for sure. Um, and I want to tell this quick story is, is I was in Tampa, went to Tampa and I was catching Jake and and I couldn't we just couldn't get on the same page for whatever reason. And, you know, this is part of that catcher pitcher catcher relationship that I always I always talk about. Again, it's our number one pillar. It's the most important thing to me. We just couldn't get on the same page. So we're I'll never forget. We're in Chicago and, you know, we kind of look at each other. We're sitting on the bench and they have the big uh, 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 Italian beef sub on the back of the dugout there at that time. I think it was the Buena, Bueno, Buena Italian beef sub. So we couldn't get on the same page, right? So we kind of look at each other and we're like, hey, let's go get an Italian beef sub tomorrow and just talk, you know? So I said, <laughs> that sounds great. That sounds like a great idea. First off, I love to eat, so that's even better. <laughs> uh, we're in Chicago. So we wind up going and getting a, a, a Italian beef sub, sitting there talking at lunch, and we just kind of talked through some things. And from that point on, we were on the same page. And from that point on, we've we've been in uh, constant contact with each other, um, and we truly built a a lasting friendship, um, which is cool because from two guys that you know different backgrounds couldn't get on the same page, like didn't work well together. All it took was for us to say, "Hey, let's get away from the field." And let's just talk about whatever doesn't have to be baseball necessarily, but that opened up the, the, the lane for us to start getting back into how can I be better for him? You know, and, and he, he saw that I cared about him. I wanted to spend time with him. And again, we just built that relationship to where, um, you know, it's safe to say I can call him one of my better friends, you know, uh, in life and in baseball. Um, but with Odorizzi, like, you know, understanding how guys want to pitch for, for Odo, it was, I didn't understand that he didn't necessarily love pitching in as much. So basically what he would tell me is like, Hey, just give me a fastball away, get set up away. And then let me rip this, you know, 20 to 22 inch vertical fastball. Sometimes it might be down the way. Other times it's probably going to be up. Sometimes it's going to carry arm side. Um, you know, it's kind of a, a big spray for a catcher, but that's what he wanted, you know, and that was something that I was missing. So understanding how he was trying to do that, um, again, made our life easier. Um, and then obviously, you know, the, the splitter working off that or the Vulcan, um, for those of you that don't know what the Vulcan is, it's basically just, you know, splitting your finger that way and basically holds the ball right in here and kind of goes that way compared to the traditional circle change, which is that, um, you know, so basically there it is. The Vulcan just splits it. And basically it, it plays like a split finger instead of going that way. Yeah. So that's kind of the change up grip that he throws. Um, you know, obviously has his cutter slider and, and a, a curveball that he uses early. So 
Um, that'll be something going into spring again, like our, you know, Jonah, Mitch, Sam Huff, they're going to have to learn him, um, understand what makes him tick. Um, so I'm looking forward to it. And then uh, Heaney, of course, I've, I've faced him. Um, it's a lot of funk, man. It's a lot of funk. Fastball slider change up. Um, fastball's got carry. Uh, and again, it's it's um, it's not the 22 inch vertical carry, but it's a it's a it's a carry that with the funk, with the run, it's, it's tough to handle. And, you know, up to 95, 96, um, was in 93, 96, somewhere in that range. Um, you know, and obviously the slider, um, but again, like don't know him well, looking forward to getting around him and hearing what he has to say and what makes him tick. So, um, it's, it's exciting times right now. It really is because, um, you know, you saw with Martin Perez last year, every time he pitched, you saw the intensity level crank up a little bit, you know, because you don't want to let Martin down. I think you're going to see that more so when you have DeGrom on the mound, when you have Heaney on the mound, when you have Odorizzi on the mound, um, you know, with John Gray, you know, there's five guys in that rotation as of right now. Um, and not to leave out, you know, Dane or, or, or Glenn Otto or Cole, uh, you know, but you're going to see that heightened intensity now when these guys are on the mound. And that's kind of um, what I've seen over the last couple of years is there's been uh, a letdown when there hasn't been the number one on the mound. So with that depth, you're going to see, I, I feel you see that intensity, that that attention to details a little bit higher. All right. One last thing I want to ask you about, and I guess this can apply to both Odorizzi and Heaney, uh, but just specifically looking at Heaney, the Dodgers had him last year. He had this elite strikeout rate. He struck out uh, nearly 14 batters per nine innings, which is absurd. But mm -hmm. it was in a, a smaller sample. They, they did it in bursts. Uh, you know, it, it seems like he's was used kind of as that hybrid starter these days where, you know, he started all but I think two of his outings. But there were outings where he went four innings and four innings – no runs, one or two hits. So it wasn't like four innings because he was getting shelled, but they decided what was best in their eyes and in, in using Andrew Heaney was doing it in kind of that, that hybrid role. Uh, we're seeing that more and more. Uh, and we're also seeing in response to that, more and more relievers who are multi-inning relievers. Uh, you know, Taylor Hearn, for instance, fulfilled that role once he was moved to the bullpen last year. Uh, I'm just curious your thoughts. You know, you, you grew up playing in a, hey, I want seven innings out of the starter, set up man, closer, see you later, let's do it again tomorrow. Uh, but starters took pride in that, and I'm not saying Andrew Heaney doesn't take pride in that, but clearly the people calling the shots have felt like there is a winning formula uh, for certain guys not having them you know, push 100 pitches. Heaney didn't throw more than uh, 90 pitches uh, I think all but two times. And, and a lot of times he was in that 70 or so pitch range. I'm just curious your thoughts on that as someone who I know thinks, uh, thinks about the game, like a manager. And uh, you know, as you think about the pieces that the the team is, is, is putting together uh, just the evolution of how a starter is maybe utilized here in 2022, 2023. Yeah. And that, to your point, it was, you know, kind of the standard was if you pitch 200 innings and you get 10 wins, right. You get, you get paid. That was kind of the standard, um, you know, my first few years in the big leagues. Uh, at this point, it's, you know, I, I think that analytics has has played a huge role in that, understanding, um, you know, averages third time through the lineup. I think we've seen that. Um, and and I think it's tougher for hitters these days to adjust, right? The The more that you see a guy, the more comfortable you get facing him. Um, you know what his ball's doing more. I think with these guys kind of uh, coming in, like you said, two inning spurts uh, um, with the relievers, um, I think it's getting tougher for hitters to handle that. Uh, I really do because, you know, you might see that guy, but you're only going to see him once, and then that guy's generally going to be down two or three days before he pitches again. Um, so it's not like, uh, um, you know, and, and in the playoffs, you see like, you you know, you're six, seven, eight, ninth inning guys, you'll see them every time throughout that series. You know, whereas in the in the regular season, you know, you might get uh, um, Taylor Hearn for one series and, you know, you might not see him again for another 
whatever, six, seven, eight series down the road. So, um, and it's like, here you go. Here's your best bolt. Go ahead and get him, Taylor, for two innings at, you know, 96 to 98. Um, I just think that, uh, like I said, the analytics have played a role in that. Um, understanding that averages, exit velocities, all that stuff kind of creeps up the more you see somebody. So, um, and, and honestly, like we have more guys that are 95 plus too, you know, as the old guy, again, in my day, there wasn't, you know, if you saw a reliever throwing 95 plus, he was the back end of the bullpen, you know, nowadays it's, and it used to be, Hey, let's get to the mop-up guy. Now it's like, no, we don't want the mop-up guy because the mop-up guy is actually nastier than the closer because he's still trying to figure out how to pitch. So um, I would just say the increase in, in velocity and spin definitely plays a role in that. Um, you have more guys in the bullpen that throw harder. Actually, all of them throw hard now. So, like I said, you can you can somewhat protect them a little bit too, I think, with that. So, again, analytics, uh, medical protection, um, and then not seeing that guy as much. So that would be kind of my thoughts behind that right now. Well, I'm looking forward to more conversations with you here over the course of the offseason, catching up with Bobby Wilson. We have tornado sirens going off here in DFW right now. So uh, uh, hopefully we'll duck and cover. Uh, and maybe it's just a warning to the rest of Major League Baseball that the Rangers mean business. How about that for like a quarter yeah. kind of tie in? Bobby, uh, I understand you went to the match recently. Maybe next time we'll talk about that experience. Uh, we'll talk more baseball, I'm sure, as well coming up. Uh, more conversations with Bobby Wilson. Bobby, thanks so much for joining us. Oh, yeah. Thanks for having me, man. This is awesome. I love doing this with you.